Genesis chapter 11. We've just learned about a massive flood where waters destroyed everything on the earth except for eight souls. That was Mo, uh, Noah and his wife, his three boys, and their three wives. And we learned about those three boys um, and, and their descendants. Now in chapter 11, we take a peek at something going on during that time. So in verse 1, the Bible says, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. That's interesting. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. I didn't think about having a map, but there, a map would be helpful here. Um, well, that's perfect. While the humans, this is Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their descendants, were somewhere in the east over here. Somewhere around here. And as they journeyed from the east, it says they found a plain in the land of Shinar. And what we have today is a plain here in the land called Mesopotamia. You might have heard of that. The Bible talks about that region called Mesopotamia. Today, it's modern Iraq, and right down here is Kuwait. So where those oil wars happened with uh, George Bush and the war on terror, a lot of it was in that area, and they dwelt there. So they found this comfortable, nice plain that has two really nice rivers, and instead of spreading abroad on the earth like they were supposed to and spreading all out, they just set up camp and decided we're going to stay here. So let's see how that goes for them. Now was that all of them? The whole earth was of one language and of one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. It looks to me like everybody was packed up together. Ham, Shem, Japheth, and all their descendants were traveling all together. They didn't want to lose each other, it seems like. And you know how family is. You don't want to get separated. Uh, and God had told them in chapter 9 and verse 1, he told Noah and his three boys, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. He had made it very clear, I want you to fill up the whole surface of the earth with people. And instead, they were all just sitting together there in the land of Shinar. In chapter 10, verse 8, we saw a man named Nimrod. In the beginning of his kingdom, um, 10, verse 8, And Cush begat Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalna in the land of Shinar. So what we have here is while they're setting up camp and while they're all dwelling here in the land of Shinar Nimrod becomes their ruler and he starts a city called Babel it says the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Babel is right about up here if you go on a map you can find Baghdad Iraq and Babel is about 65 miles just due south of Baghdad it's right in between the Tigris and the Euphrates it's a beautiful spot it's gorgeous land. Today it's kind of deserty and gross, but back in the day it was gorgeous when it was well watered, just like the Garden of Eden. And so it's right around here, close to the modern day capital of Iraq. That's where Babel was, which later becomes Babylon. And Nimrod was the leader or king of this nation. And to this day, Nimrod is still worshipped by Satanists by name. They mention Nimrod in their evil prayers, and they worship him, and so do all the other false religions in the world, and those who follow Babylonian religion. Now, what I'm going to let you know today is history has done a good job of preserving what they did in Babylonian religion, all the way back to Nebuchadnezzar, and way before him, all the way back to Nimrod. You say, what was their religion like? Why did God despise that Babylonian nation so much? Well, here are some of the things that the Babylonians did in their religion. They worshipped a mother and a child duo. Holy mother, holy child. They observed a mass. They took of a wafer that they called a Eucharist that they believed made them clean. They believed in purgatory. They believed in a sovereign pontiff. That's a fancy word for pope. 
They prayed for the dead. And they lit candles when they did it. They used rosary beads. That's what Catholics do when they pray a little rosary. And they, uh, <laughs> An old preacher that I used to listen to, or still listen to every now and then, named Bob Alexander, had this... Uh, I forgot exactly how it went, but he said... It, the, the good version of Hail Mary, the good way to make fun of the Catholics, they say, you know, Hail Mary, full of grace, blessed is the fruit of the, thy womb, I think is what they say, and it goes on, that Hail Mary that they repeat over and over. He would say, Hail Mary, full of grace, swing them beads all over the place. Talking about the rosary. <laughs> um, these Babylonians, now right now I'm not talking about Catholicism, believe it or not, I'm talking about what they did in ancient Babylon they used this sign right here. That's the sign of the cross. They would do, you know, headache, heartache, where's my cigarettes? The sign of the cross, which Catholics do every single day today, it's nothing but Nimrod worship. Worship of the false god and the, the mother, Mary. They had a confessional booth where the religious folks would go in and talk to their priest about the things they had done wrong, and the priest would tell them what they needed to do to make up for their wrongdoing. They worshiped images. They had priests, they had monks, and they had nuns. They worshipped relics. They would find historical artifacts and say that they were holy and worship them. They called their priests father. Their priests wore black robes, and they, as a religion, worshipped a female deity that Jeremiah calls the Queen of Heaven. Jeremiah doesn't call it that. They called it the Queen of Heaven, and Jeremiah records that, that they would call that female deity the Queen of Heaven. That is Babylonian religion. Babylon. Wicked. I mean, obviously false. None of this is commanded in the scripture. None of this is biblical Christianity, obviously. We should not follow Babylonian religion. And it's very clear that this religion exists today in the Catholic Church. If that wasn't obvious, the Catholic Church is Babel worship. It is just Babylonian worship of Nimrod. It is wicked. It is evil. If you want to really take some time and learn a lot about it and spend maybe 10 bucks buying the book, there's a book called The Two Babylons by a man named Alexander Hislop, and you can find it on Amazon, Two Babylons, and he spells out a whole lot more than this and shows how that the Catholics are doing exactly what the Babylonians did back in the day. And uh, that's no coincidence. It's because they're worshiping the same God, the devil. And that's Satan's religion on earth. And if you study your Bible at all, you know that in Revelation, there is a mystery called Mystery Babylon the Great. It's very clear once you study to see that Babylon the Great in Revelation is the Roman Catholic Church. And the Roman Catholic Church didn't start with Constantine. It started with Nimrod. Same old Babylonian religion, and it goes back thousands of years. And it's wicked. It's not just innocent, you know, uh, uh, it dominates the United States of America. As far as I know, Catholicism, I know it used to be, we might be outnumbered now, but Catholicism was the largest religion in the world. It has over 2 billion, 2 billion followers. Most of the Hispanic people in the world follow Babylonian Catholicism. Um, you know, six out of our nine Supreme Court justices are Roman Catholic. Most of Joe, Bi Joe Biden's a Roman Catholic. Most of his cabinets, Roman Catholic, I mean, Roman Catholicism dominates the world. It is the religion that Satan uses and the Antichrist uses to be ready for when Jesus Christ comes or for when the tribulation time comes. <laughs> Satan's got to have his church, the Catholic church, ready to go because that's what he's going to use to take over the world and to, to control people. So, we're two verses deep. They dwelt in the land of Shinar. Verse 3, And they said one to another, Go to... Let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. Now, if you remember, we talked about Cain and how he was supposed to be a farmer, and God told the people, Adam, to till the ground. He wanted Adam to work in the ground and farm, to garden specifically. And instead, Cain, and then later we saw Ham, and now these people in Babel are not gardening and farming. They're making bricks and building cities and doing everything except for what God told them to do. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. 
Now, remember, God did not want them gathering together to build one huge city. God wanted them to spread out and fill the face of the whole earth. There's only one God-approved city, and that's New Jerusalem. That's in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 12, that holy city. And they said, let us build a city and a tower. Now, a tower, if you remember in the Garden of Eden, we're going to look at something interesting here. If you remember in the Garden of Eden, <clears throat> Satan and Eve had an inappropriate relationship. If you remember in Genesis chapter 6, angels and women had an inappropriate relationship. Obviously, the devil and his angels have a problem with that specific sin, and that's what they try to get women uh, to fall to. And if you were to worship the devil, if you wanted to get the devil's attention and try to get angels' attention, what you would do is try to get him to commit that sin. Here's, it's very obvious to anybody who studies the Bible that cities are of the devil. Here's something else that is of the devil, towers. I'm not saying a tower is wicked in and of itself. Here's what I'm saying. A tower, the first one ever built, the purpose of it was satanic. And just about every tower since then, I believe, is satanic. And Jesus, not Jesus, God even says, either in Jeremiah or Ezekiel, he says, I am against your high towers, which I think applies to just about every city in the world where they get together and then because there's so many people in one place they have to build this big huge tower and these towers think about um, ancient Egypt had these type of towers they would build them and they call them obelisks an obelisk is you know you probably recognize it the Washington Monument in Washington DC is an obelisk it looks like that we have one of those a small one in Carthage when you pull up to the courthouse and all it is is a satanic image and to be appropriate, what it's called, if you understand, is a phallic symbol, is what that is. And towers are nothing but that. So go to any city on the planet and you'll find these towers that are shaped like that. And all it is, is a temptation to the devil and to his angels to, hey, come back. We, This is what we want on earth. Hey, Satan, we're trying to remind you of something. And it's evil and it's wicked. It says, a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. This new civilization, which was called Babel, eventually turns into Babylon. And for its symbolism, it has this a giant, you know, phallic symbol that reaches unto heaven, a great reminder and a temple dedicated to angels. And I believe a part of it was this right here. The wicked men on the planet up until Genesis 6 had power. They had great men, they had mighty men, men of renown, and they had giants. And they accomplished great things like building the pyramids, and, and all the other massive megalithic uh, structures that you see around the world that are very impressive. And if you study mythology, they did great, wonderful things. Think about Zeus. Not great, wonderful things. They did powerful things. Zeus, Achilles, Hercules, all these Norse gods, uh, you know, Thor and Odin and Loki. All these mythologies are true stories about these descendants of angels who slept with women. And I believe that after the flood... The humans, who were just ordinary humans again, missed that power that they had. And I believe the Tower of Babel was their first attempt at, hey, let's build a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. Let's see if we can get the devil and his angels back down here, because we want that power once more. I, my great, 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 great grandpa, you know, Zeus was mighty powerful, you know. Get what I'm saying? So think about towers. We've got the Washington Monument, which is in Washington, D.C. We've got one in Carthage. There's an obelisk just like this one. Guess where it is? Right outside St. Peter's Basilica, the holy temple of the Roman Catholic Church. They've got one right in the dead center of their courtyard. There's an obelisk outside that uh, courthouse in Carthage. The Seattle Space Needle, very similar. You've got the Empire State Building. You've got the Sears Tower in Chicago. Every skyscraper you find in Los Angeles, Chicago, New York. New Orleans, Miami, Washington, D.C., Atlanta, Charlotte, Raleigh, Winston-Salem. What do they all look like? The same type of thing. God said, I am against your high towers. They're wicked. They're devilish. And they are nothing but a city that has gotten together in rebellion against God and is now tempting Satan and his angels to, hey, come down. We want you again. It's all artwork by the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And if you don't remember, in the book of Daniel, 
it's very clear that what the devil and his angels did in Genesis 6 will happen again in the tribulation. And the spirit of the Antichrist, which is now in the world, according to Paul, is going to be doing the same types of things and always has his images and always wants to be reminding people of his wickedness. So, I won't go any past that. There's more you could go, but I'll stop right there. Verse 5. I'm sorry, verse 4, I want to make sure I, I get this part. Let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And just like Pastor mentioned the other day, I, I don't know if they were trying to get to heaven. I kind of doubt it. I don't think they were trying to actually get to God in heaven. The, that phrase, reach unto, in the Bible, usually means like stretch out towards. So I think they were just trying to summon whatever was up there to come on back down. We miss you. Come on back. Let us make a name, which they did, Babylon, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Remember this. Why did they build a city and a tower? Lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. They were afraid of being scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And right up here to help you remember, I'll just put the scattered abroad. This is what they did not want. Okay. Verse 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. Remember, they didn't get the tower built yet. They were just talking about building it. Now they were working on it. Verse 6. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do. Notice they begin to do. So they were just working on the beginning of this city and the tower. It wasn't fully built yet. This they begin to do. And now, pay attention right here, nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Whoa. Nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. That means when humans get together into a city and they all put their minds together and they're all speaking the same language, they can produce some powerful, interesting stuff. I mean, that little phone right there is more powerful than any computer that existed in 2010. When people get together, they can pump out some impressive stuff. Here's the problem. It's not always good stuff. It's usually wicked stuff. And it usually allows us to be more and more wicked. And God said, anything that they set their mind to do, they can do. And he didn't see that as a good thing. He saw that as a bad thing. They can come up with whatever wickedness they want to and get it done. And a part of God's purpose for putting bounds between the nations. If you remember in Acts 17, it says he set the bounds. Part of his purpose was so that they wouldn't come together and do wickedness like this right here. Okay, verse 7. God is talking. Go to, let us go down and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. <laughs> so, the Lord scattered them abroad upon the face of all the earth. We don't want to be scattered. Let's build a city. So what does God do? All right. He scatters them abroad. You think you can just all disobey me and have no consequences? Maybe I should just kill them again with a flood. Oh, wait. No, I can't do that. I promised I wouldn't. So I'll just change their languages, and I'll send them abroad upon the face of the whole earth. This should tell you something. There's a verse in Proverbs that says, Though hand join in hand, the wicked shall not be unpunished. There's a few other verses that go along that same line. And it doesn't matter how many bad people team up against God and join hands and, you know, go look at Pride Month in June. You'll see homosexuals holding hands and rebelling against God. And they're all joined together trying to show we're all together against God on this thing. And though hand join in hand, the wicked shall not be unpunished. It doesn't matter how many people team up in their rebellion against God. He's going to win. And this right here is just another example. They all got together and decided we're not going to be scattered abroad. And God, you know, okay. All right. Yeah, we'll see. So if God determines that he wants something to happen, there's nothing you can do to stop that. In the book of Daniel, it says no man can stay his hand. That means if his hand is going to do something, you can't stop it. You can't stop God. And it's good advice to not try to stop God from whatever he's doing. So he did confound their language. And in verse 9, no, the end of verse 8, yeah. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence 
upon the face of all the earth. And hey, you know, <laughs> if you go and look at any atheist who studies history, you know what they'll say? The first intelligent civilization was in Sumer, S-U-M-E-R. Guess where that was? Shinar. They'll say, all evidence points to the fact that humankind came from this area. Well, beep. Yeah, after the flood, all the humans were right here and then they spread out from there. And archaeology proves that. And they say that all humans came from right here, so doi. The Bible is true, once again, atheists are always 50 steps behind the Bible and just trying to catch up. They left off to build the city. Verse 9, therefore is the name of it called Babel. Because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. So you say, why is it called Babel? Because literally, you know, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> if you were talking to somebody, you've probably heard it preached a thousand times, but, you know, they were working on the foundation, I reckon. And, you know, if you say, hey, we need some more slime for this brick over here, the guy says, how many? And you go, you know, you can't understand what he says. Just all of a sudden, they start speaking different languages and they can't get along anymore. It's just, it was just a bunch of babble. Nobody could understand what anybody was saying, so they quit what they were doing and they spread out. That's why they call it Babel. And I think something beautiful about that is that Satan's religion, Babylon, you know, is a make-fun word. It's a mocking word about him. It's just babbling. You know, it's, it's nonsense. It's ridiculousness. And that's all it is in a Catholic church is just Babel. This is the beginning of the kingdom of Babylon. And like we said, if you want to write it down, Revelation 17 and verse 5 is where you have mystery, Babylon the Great, which is obviously the Catholic Church. It's Nimrod worship, it's Baal worship, it's Mary worship, it's Pope worship, all the same. And Catholicism is just modern-day Babylon. We're going to read through verses 10 through 26, but we're going to skip some things. So it's again, it's a bunch of names and, and where they go, but it'll, it'll go through this list of humans. Verse 10, these are the generations of Shem, in the New Testament spelled Sem. <clears throat> and Shem lived after he begat, I'm sorry, Shem was 100 years old and begat Arphaxad two years after the flood. And Shem lived after he begat Arphaxad 500 years and begat sons and daughters. And Arphaxad lived five and 30 years and begat Selah, verse 14. And Selah begat 30 years and begat Eber, verse 16. And Eber lived four and 30 years and begat Peleg, or right here, Phalek. And if you remember, it says, the earth was divided in his day. So this Tower of Babel happened during Peleg, or Phalek's lifetime. Verse 18, and Peleg lived 30 years and begat Ru, or in the New Testament spelled Ragau, uh, which reminds me of some kind of pasta out of a can. Verse 20, and Ru lived two and 30 years and begat Sirug, or Sirach, Verse 22, Sarug lived 30 years and begat Nahor. Verse 24, and Nahor lived 9 and 20 years and begat Terah. Verse 25, and Nahor lived after he begat Terah uh, 119 years and begat sons and daughters. And Terah lived 70 years and begat three men, Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Where's my eraser? So we've got Terah, who's going to be our grandpa in this story. T-E-R-A-H. He has three sons. Who are they? Abram. 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 What was the second one? Nahor? Nahor, yes. And the third one was? Haran. Or Haran. Okay? Abram, Nahor, and Haran are brothers. Three amigos. And Terah lived... I'm sorry. Uh, verse, where was I? 20, verse 27. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran begat a familiar name, Lot. You remember him? He begat Lot. And Haran died before his father, Terah, in the land of his nativity in, right here, Ur- of the Chaldees. This is where Terah lived. This is just a little bit south of Babylon. So you can find the ancient ruins just on Google Maps, but Babylon was up here. Ur is just a little bit down here. So when the people had started to spread, they had just gone a little bit south at this point when Abraham's born. 
and Ur of the Chaldees down here. Eventually, God's going to send Abram over to Canaan, but for now, he's in Ur of the Chaldees. Twenty-nine, and Abram and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai. So Abram's got Sarai, later Sarah, and Nahor, um, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milka. Now there's a problem here. Not a problem, but it's just a little weird for me. Milka, the daughter of Haran the father of Milka and the father of Iska. So Haran obviously had three kids, Milka, Iska, and Lot. And Nahor married Milka. So he married, married his niece. And back then, I guess it was a whole lot more normal. Inbreeding wasn't an issue yet. God hadn't commanded against it yet until the law. And right here, we've got Nahor marrying his niece. You say, that's terrible. Well, I've got you one word. Sarai was Abram's sister, his blood sister. Uh, half-sister. And we'll look at the verse for that. Genesis chapter 20, verse 12. You can write that one down. Genesis 20, 12. Abraham is talking about his wife, Sarah, and he says, and in, yet indeed, she is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. It doesn't say that where we are in Genesis 11, but Later on, it gives us that light. So Abram marries his sister, uh, Sarai, half-sister. And verse 30, chapter 11, verse 30. But Sarai was barren. She had no child. And Terah took Abram his son and Lot the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. And they came unto this place right here, Haran. They came unto Haran and dwelt there. And the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Now, there's a couple things we need to pay attention to here. When they leave Ur of the Chaldees, first, their brother Haran has already died. Second, they bring Lot, and they bring Abraham and Sarah, and they bring Terah. These are the ones who leave Ur of the Chaldees, and they're supposed to go over towards the land of Canaan. We'll see that here in a minute. But instead, they're supposed to go west towards the land of Canaan, but instead they go from here, Ur of the Chaldees, they just go a little bit north to a city called Haran that's named after their, you know, somebody, great, great something, uh, Haran. And in chapter 12, I'm sorry, first, Acts chapter 7 and verse 2. Uh, Acts 7 verse 2. In Acts 7 we've got somebody preaching. I believe it's Stephen. You want to write that one down next to Ur of the Chaldees. Acts chapter 7 verse 2. Ur of the Chaldees is where Abram came from. And Stephen says in Acts 7, he said, men and brethren and fathers, hearken, the God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Karan. So the Bible calls this place, Ur of the Chaldees, he calls it Mesopotamia. Messy potato land or something like that. And Haran, he calls it Karan. It's the same place. And Stephen makes it clear that God came to Abraham before they left to Haran. So while they were still in Ur, we have Genesis 12, verse 1, where God comes to Abraham. Uh, sorry, side note, in Isaiah 13, verse 19, if you want it, these Chaldeans, Isaiah 13, 19, that's just another name for Babylonians. They're not exactly the same, but the people who are of the Babylonian nation are called Chaldeans. So they're still living around Babylon. <coughs> 
in that same kingdom. And that tells you right there that the Jews came out of Babylon, Babel. They came away from that religion, and God wanted them out of there so that he could start his own pure nation. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. We're just going to dig a couple verses into Genesis 12. Now, pay attention right here. I'm not even in Genesis 12. It says, now the Lord had said unto Abram. You say when? Before they went to Haran. The Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country. So what was Abram's country? Ur of the Chaldees, Mesopotamia, Babylon. I mean, his, that was his nation. He belonged to that nation. That was his country. Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. So before they left to Haran... God told Abraham, get out of your father's house, get out of your nation, and go to a land that I'll tell thee of. And right away, instead of obeying, he goes with his father to Haran, and with Lot, and with Abram, unto the land that I will show thee. Verse 2, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless him them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now that's good news for a, a grandpa. The problem is, at this time, Abram doesn't have any kids, and if you remember from chapter 11, Sarah is barren. She can't have children. Amen. Chapter 12, verse 4. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 70 and 5 years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarah his wife and Lot his brother's son and all their substance that they had gathered and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. And into the land of Canaan they came. So you say, what's the order of things here? It's a little confusing, Daniel. Here's the order. They all lived in Ur. While they were in Ur, God told Abram, get thee out of thy country and out of thy father's house. He was supposed to go ahead and go. Instead, he went with his father up to Haran and lived there for a little bit, waited till his dad died. Then when his dad died, he decided to obey, and he got up and went over towards the land of Canaan. Make sense? That'll come up uh, a little bit later. It's kind of important. Obviously, it's important because God included all those details in the Bible. <clears throat> I'm going to stop right there because we need to take a lot more time to look at the rest of the story of Abram and what's going to go on here. But I wanted to give you one more detail about the timing here. So, Peleg that we talked about, Phelek there, the Bible says that the earth was divided in his days. So the Tower of Babel happened during Peleg's lifetime. And Peleg died in this year right here, 2047 B.C., That's when Peleg died. So the Tower of Babel happened sometime around then or right before. And then in 2035 BC, that's 12 years later, Abram is born. The reason I wanted to point that out is because when you're reading those genealogies, it seems like just all these thousands of years pass by it's not really that much. I mean, Peleg is just a couple hundred years after the flood. So the Tower of Babel is just a couple hundred years after the flood, maybe just a hundred. And then Abram is just 12 years after the Tower of Babel or so. And that shows you the connection. That shows you that God wasn't just letting all this time by. He had a plan right after the Tower of Babel, very shortly after the flood, to establish a nation called Israel. And he chose Abram to be the leader of his nation. Um, and Abram is such a very, very special and important character. He's not just the physical father of all the Jews. He is the spiritual father, is what the New Testament calls him, of all those who believe the same way he did. You and I, if we believe in Jesus Christ, are the seed of Abraham because we're in Christ. And Abraham is a very important, very important... Abram born. Oh, I thought it... Okay. Um... Abraham is extremely important, and uh, I hope that this has helped you a little bit in your understanding. It was a little more technical than 
teach you, but I hope you learned a thing or two, and that helps set the framework for us to learn about Abraham and his life. And uh, any questions at all about anything that we've gone over here? Yeah. Yeah. After uh, verse 16. Which chapter? Uh, 11. Okay. Why the drastic drop in age? Yeah. It was a, you know, that's what, uh, let's see, 15 was uh, 400 years. Oh, yeah. And then you got a drastic drop, and then, you you know, it keeps getting lower and lower and lower all the way back. Right. Why? Because in Genesis 6, a part of the judgment that came with the flood, God said in Genesis 6, my spirit, this is Genesis 6, 3, my spirit shall not always strive with man. So he was sick of dealing with man. He was sick of his spirit striving with mankind. He said he shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days, so man's days, shall be 120. After the flood, God's established and ordained age for a man to live is 120 years, which I believe still exists to this day. The problem is... We live in a really filthy and corrupted, sin-cursed world, and we die young, especially in America, because of all the junk we put in our bodies for years and years, and just around the world. It's so polluted and wicked, I think we die young. A lot of people claim a passage in Genesis that talks about, I forgot, no, I'm sorry, not Genesis, in Psalms, where it talks about 70 being the years that God has promised to the righteous, but that is a passage talking very specifically about the 70 years that the Jews are serving Babylon. Um, and maybe even the 70 weeks, but it's a Jewish passage for Jews. That right there in Genesis 6 is God saying, I let Abraham, I let Adam and I let Methuselah and Noah live, you know, 950 plus years, but after the flood, his days shall be 120. So he started, I don't know what changed exactly. Um, you know, maybe after the flood, maybe our air was worse. Maybe we got more exposure to the sun. I don't know, you know. All I know is they started living a whole lot shorter, a whole lot, I mean, quick. It, like, they, those years started dropping really quick. And uh, I'm kind of thankful that I don't have to live 900 years because 25 has already been a bit much. <laughs> I love Karen and I love that baby, but boy, I'm, I'm ready to meet the Lord. And I hope you are too. That's a good question. Any others? Okay. Let's pray. And then we'll uh, finish off. Pastor, do you have any announcements? For yeah, just a, just a reminder for the uh, youth tomorrow meeting here at the church at 1030. And um, anything you can add to that, just meet here at 1030, right? Yep. And then, of course, Sunday school, 10 o'clock, and preaching at 11.